Friends and partners of Andrew Womack Ministries, celebrating 40 years of sharing God's unconditional love and grace. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack. Today, Andrew illustrates that knowing God is not just for the privileged, not just for those who found a formula. Knowing God is for everyone. Now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. This is the end of my fourth week of teaching on the subject of knowing God. I have a brand new teaching out entitled Knowing God. It's a five-part set. And one week from today, I'm going to be concluding this teaching. Today, we're concluding our teaching on the fourth teaching in this five-part set. This fourth teaching is entitled Knowing God Through the Word. And today is my last day to make that individual teaching in this available to you as a free gift. We'll be giving out more information about that at the end of our program. This week, what I've been doing, I, I've spent four weeks now talking about knowing God, how important it is, how it's the goal of salvation. Actually, if you get your sins forgiven and yet don't enter into an intimate relationship with God, you're missing the purpose of salvation. Jesus removed our sins, not so that we could just have them removed and get rid of some guilt and go to heaven, but so that we could experience Him, so that we could enter into relationship. And I've talked about how that we have to do that by faith, not through any of the physical, natural ways. You just can't intellectually come to know God or wait on an audible voice or see a visible sign. We have to walk by faith. And then this week, I've been talking about that the way you start walking by faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And so we've got to take the Word of God and let that reveal God to us. It's through the Word of God that we come to know God. And I've also coupled this with the Holy Spirit because it's not just the letter, it's not just a intellectual dissecting of the Word, but it's taking the truths represented in the Word and letting the Holy Spirit reveal them unto us. What I want to do today is to show you how John the Baptist actually doubted who Jesus was. This is after he at one time had been absolutely convinced that Jesus was the Son of God and it pronounced him as the Son of God. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And yet, when he got locked up in prison and he got shut up and was facing an impending death, discouragement began to hit him and he actually doubted if Jesus was the Messiah. Now, he not only had this, uh, he not only said this on his own, but it was revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit. He had two signs. He said, upon, you who, upon whom you see the Spirit of God descending in the bodily form and hear me say, this is my beloved Son, that this is the one. And both of those things happened. John knew it in his heart. He had these visible signs. And yet, after being shut up in prison for an undetermined amount of time, he doubted whether Jesus was really the Christ. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 2, it says, Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And you can try and whitewash this any way you want to, but the bottom line is John the Baptist wavered in his faith about whether Jesus was really the Messiah. And this was critical to John because he wasn't normal. He didn't grow up like most of us and have a normal childhood and a childhood sweetheart and family and children. From the day he was born, he went out into the deserts, was separated unto God, spent his whole time preparing for this ministry, had only been ministering for six months, saw the greatest revival that's ever recorded in the Word of God, and then took all of these people who came to him and sent them after Jesus. And if Jesus wasn't really the Messiah, then John made the greatest mistake of his life. He just voided his whole life, and he sent the entire nation after the wrong person. This was critical. And Jesus later on said in Matthew chapter 11, I'm going to skip down to verse 11. He says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus respected John the Baptist. They were cousins. 
Mary and Elizabeth were cousins, and so therefore John and Jesus were, I guess, second cousins. I don't know exactly how to say that, but they were related. And he respected John not only, you know, in that sense, but as a, the greatest prophet that had ever walked on the face of the earth. And yet, how did Jesus respond to John in this crisis period when he was having doubts? What did Jesus do? Look at this. It says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 4, that Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And if you read this same account in Luke's uh, gospel, this is the reason I've got our Life for Today study Bible out is because I've... I've taken the Gospels and I've arranged them not just going through Matthew and then Mark and Luke, but I've arranged them chronologically so that you have all of the Scripture's accounts on one instance right here on one page. And in Luke's account, it says that when John asked this question, it says in verse 21, and in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and evil spirits and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, etc., and tell John these things. When you put these accounts together, what actually happened is that when John's messengers came, Jesus didn't even respond to them for about an hour's period of time, and he just healed people, opened up blind eyes, raised people from the dead, did all of these miracles, and then he responded and told them, Go back and tell John, Blessed is he if he'll believe and not be offended. And you know what? Especially when you take into account those verses that I've already read where Jesus later on, look at this down in Luke's account of this same thing. In Luke chapter 7, verse 24, it says, And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. And he said, What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? Of course, this is a sarcastic statement. What Jesus is saying, what is it that drew tens of thousands of people out into the wilderness? Was it the reeds blowing in the wind? Certainly not, because the reeds had been there for centuries, and there hadn't been multitudes out in the wilderness. It wasn't the reeds. He says, what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Was it the fact that John was such a fancy dresser? that everybody went into the desert? Nope, that's certainly not it. He says, Behold, they which are gorgeously apparel live delicately are in king's courts. You know, John the Baptist was a rough-looking guy. He wore a camel skin. And I've heard people say before that the only thing that smells worse than a camel skin garment is if it gets wet. And John the Baptist baptized people, so he was always in the water. I'm sure he was quite the sight and smell. And so in verse 26, Jesus said, But what went ye out for to see, a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. This is a quotation from Malachi chapter 3. It was one of the last prophecies of the Old Testament. It was predicting that there would be somebody come in the spirit and the power of Elijah that would turn the people's hearts towards God and prepare the way of the Messiah. So this is saying that John the Baptist was this man prophesied. This is putting tremendous, tremendous recognition and uh, clout upon John. And then he said in verse 28, For I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. These are tremendous things to be said. And when I read these things, I thought, Lord, why did you wait until John's messengers were gone to say that this is the one that was prophesied in the Old Testament? This is the greatest prophet that has ever walked on the face of the earth. It seems like that if John was discouraged and wasn't really sure whether Jesus was the right one, why didn't he say these complimentary things while Jesus was there? Or excuse me, while John the Baptist's messengers were there? Why did he wait until they were gone before he said the things that would have ministered to me and probably most people. See, most people, when you get discouraged, when you begin to doubt, you don't really want the truth. You want somebody to come hug you, give you a hug, you know, give you a little emotional thing that might help you and give you a little, you know, a little feeling at that moment, but it's not going to solve anything. 
you know, I hesitate to say this because I'll get some criticism. I don't mean it bad, but I've learned that most women, you know, my wife, if something is wrong, it's the nature of a man to say, well, here's the deal. Fix this and boing, boing, boing. You just tell them what they need to know to fix it. <laughs> it's not what women want. They don't want it fixed. They just want you to hug them. I guess that's some of the difference between men and women. The most of us are really like that. When you get to hurting emotionally, you just want a hug or you want something, but you don't want somebody coming to tell you what you need to do. But you know what? You need to know the truth. It's the truth that's going to set you free. And what Jesus did was tell John the truth. He didn't give him an emotional response, but he referred him back to the Word. Now, when I first read this, I didn't see this, but years later, after I had struggled with this about, God, why didn't you say all those complimentary things while John's messengers were there? Why did you just say, go tell him what you've seen and heard, the dead are raised, blind eyes are open, deaf ears are open, the lame walk, and he'll be blessed if he's not offended. At first, I didn't understand that until one time I was reading in Isaiah chapter 35, and over there, the scripture literally quoted. Let me see. I've got it written here in this Bible somewhere. But it, it uses these scriptures out of Isaiah chapter 35, verse 3. It says, Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Now, if I had time, I could show you that all of these verses our Old Testament prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. And specifically, they were scriptures written to the one who would prepare the way, or John the Baptist. And John quoted from this very context. He knew this, and he knew that these were scriptures that applied to him. And he goes on to say, it says, Then, when the Messiah comes, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. You know what Jesus did with John? When John was struggling to know him and wondering whether he was really the Messiah or not, and he expressed his doubt, publicly asked for help, made himself vulnerable, Jesus didn't just put his arm around John and give him a hug and say, it'll be all right, John. You know what he did? He sent him to the Word of God. He literally fulfilled Isaiah chapter 35, verses 4 and 5, or uh, 4 through 6. He fulfilled the Word. I mean, in one hour's time, he did everything that was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 35 that the Messiah, when he came, that the ears of the dumb, I mean, the ears of the deaf would be open, the tongue of the dumb would sing, the lame man would leap as a heart, the blind would see, and Jesus just threw in raising somebody from the dead just so that there would be no mistake that this wasn't coincidence but he fulfilled everything that was prophesied about him in Isaiah 35. You know what I believe Jesus was doing? He was referring John back to the Word of God. He says, John, you're doubting. You want to know whether I am really the Christ? You want to know me? Look at what I've done. And I have fulfilled the Word. So the significance of this is that if you want to really know God, if you want to alleviate your doubt, how did Jesus deal with the man that he respected more than Moses, more than Elijah, more than David, more than Jeremiah, more than Isaiah or any of the prophets? He said, this is the greatest prophet that has ever been born of a woman. How did he treat him when he needed assurance and when he needed to know? He sent him back to the Word of God. And I'm telling you that some people say, well, God, if you really love me, just give me a sign. Just let there be an audible voice. Have a dog call out my name. Have somebody prophesy to me. Have something physical, tangible. You are wanting to bring God down to this physical level, and you want some physical, tangible way of knowing for sure, God. Well, no doubt God can do those things, and He has done it, but I don't know any way to control that. It is seldom, it is rare, it's never happened to me. But you know what can happen? Instead of God coming down to our level, God can raise you up to His level, and you can come to know God through the Word. 
In the eighth chapter of the book of Matthew, there's a man who was a centurion. That means he wasn't a Jew. He was a Roman. He was not a part of the Israelites. He wasn't a part of the covenant. He had a man who was sick, a servant who was sick, and he sent to Jesus to have Jesus come heal him. And Jesus said, I will go with you. I will heal him. And the man sent other messengers and says, don't bother yourself to come into my house. I didn't feel like I was worthy to ask you to come, and I certainly don't need you to come here. He says, if you will speak the word only, my servant shall be healed. And Jesus marveled at this. There's only two times in Scripture that Jesus ever marveled. He marveled at his disciples' unbelief, and he marveled at this man's great faith. And he said, I have never found this great a faith, no, not in Israel. He said this was the greatest demonstration of faith he had ever seen. A man who believed the word only. You speak the word only. I don't have to feel something. I don't have to have a physical representation. I don't have to have my senses satisfied. You just give me a promise, and that's enough for me to believe. Jesus said that's the greatest faith he had ever seen. Now contrast that with the 20th chapter of the book of John, where one of Jesus' own disciples named Thomas, he was also also called uh, Doubting Thomas. And Thomas, after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, Jesus appeared to all of the disciples except Thomas wasn't there. And when the other disciples told him that Jesus was risen from the dead, Thomas said, I will not believe. Notice, I cannot believe or I, I can't, I, you know, I, I don't want to believe. He just made an absolute statement. I will not believe it unless I can see it unless I can touch it, unless I can put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And eight days later, Jesus appeared to the disciples again. This time Thomas was with them, and he walked right up to Thomas. And of course, he wasn't there physically when Thomas said that, and yet the next time he appeared, he knew everything that had happened. Once again, verifying that he was God. And he walked right up to Thomas, and he said, Thomas, put your finger into the print of the nails and put your hand into my side and be not faithless but believing. And Thomas fell down on his face and said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said this in, in John chapter 20. He says, Because you have seen, you have believed. Yea, rather, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus put a greater blessing upon the person who believes the word than the person who believes because they saw or felt something. Now see, if you contrast that centurion's faith that Jesus said was the greatest faith because he had the word only and he believed, and you put that together with Jesus' reaction to Thomas when he says, I will not believe unless I can see it or feel it. Jesus said there's a greater blessing on the person who believes the word. And you know, this is why he didn't come down to John the Baptist level and just give him something that would feel good and say some things that might make him feel like, oh man, the person who is the most uh, you know, famous person in Israel at this moment said these things about me. Boy, doesn't that make me feel better? No, he didn't just say something complimentary. He sent him back to the Word of God because he respected and honored John so much he wanted him to operate in the highest level of faith. There are some of you watching this program that you are just, in a sense, angry or disappointed with God about, God, why don't you do something? Why don't you send somebody over to my house? Why don't you have somebody give me a prophecy? Why don't you just give me a goose bump or a feeling? Why haven't you sent an angel? Why doesn't somebody physical do something for me? And you know why God may not have responded to you? Because he loves you and respects you so much. He's wanting to bring you up to a higher level to where you take the revelation of God's Word and instead of having somebody come by and do something supernaturally that would prove to you that God loves you, why don't you take the revelation of God's Word? Why don't you take the things I'm saying through this television program and believe that this is God speaking to you? Why don't you believe something that you can't see and get out of just waiting on something tangible to happen to take away all of your doubts and instead move up a level and move to a place to where you believe the Word of God, that He will never leave you nor forsake you, and embrace it by faith through the revelation of the Word. I believe that this is what God was doing with John the Baptist. And the Scriptures don't reveal to us the end result, 
But I believe that Jesus knew exactly what he was doing and took the right uh, path to minister to John. And it's my personal belief that when John heard this, him having been familiar with those scriptures, he quoted from Isaiah chapter 40, which was just a few verses later where he says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. John knew these scriptures by heart. And when he got this message that was relayed from Jesus through his disciples, and he got to meditating, what does this mean? I believe that God brought back to his remembrance, Isaiah chapter 35, showed him the word that how could any man doubt that Jesus was the true Messiah because he fulfilled the word in the way that no human being could ever do it. I believe that John, through the quickening power of the Holy Spirit, came to realize that this must be the Christ because he's fulfilled the word. And he put his faith back on the word, not back on somebody patting him on the back and giving him an emotional thing, but he put his faith in the word. And it's my personal conviction that I believe John went out with a shout. I believe that when they came to behead him that John was ready to go. He knew he had fulfilled his course. He had done the right thing and that the right person had been proclaimed as the Messiah. I believe that all doubt was removed. And it was because God loved him so much that he dealt with him the way that he did. You know, there was a period of time in my life where if I went to a meeting, everybody would get a prophecy but me. I mean, it was just nearly like clockwork. And it, uh, there was a time that I used to wonder about, God, what's wrong with me? You know, do I have just one eye or what is it that people stay away from me? It seems like everybody will get something special but me. And the Lord reminded me of these exact things I've shared with you and said, Andrew, you've asked me to just let you know me based on the revelation of the Word and not all of these external things. And he says, I'm dry, drawing you up into this kind of faith that you're more blessed if you believe and yet haven't seen. He says, I may not give you all the physical proofs that I've given somebody, but it's because I want you to operate in this higher type of faith. And I believe that there's many people watching this program today that maybe you felt like that, you know, you would like to have something physical, tangible happen to help your faith. And you know what? God is speaking to you through the Word today. And He's trying to draw you into that uh, type of faith that has the greater blessing on it, that you would just take the Word of God under the quickening power of the Holy Spirit and you'd believe it. And there's a greater blessing on that. I believe that God is speaking directly to many people today telling you that the way you need to know God is to go by the Word, the things that He's spoken unto you. And I want to encourage you today to yield to that, to recognize that the Word of God is the greatest way of knowing Him. It's a more sure word of testimony than anything physical, visible that we could possibly have. Knowing God through the Word is the best way of knowing Him under the quickening power of the Holy Spirit. Today's my last day to teach on this fourth part of this five-part teaching. And so today's the last day we will offer the individual teach, teaching entitled Knowing God Through the Word as a Free Gift to You. We're going to continue to offer the entire album on Knowing God through next week, but today's our last day for this individual teaching as a free gift. So please listen to our announcer, Call or write today and then join me again next week as we continue the gospel truth. Andrew's five-part teaching titled Knowing God was captured live at a recent gospel truth seminar. It's available in a CD or DVD album for a gift of 16 pounds or more. For the CD album, ask for number T1058 or request the DVD series T3203. You can also get Andrew's teachings as seen on TV by asking for DVD album number T1058 when you send a gift of 16 pounds or more. The fourth teaching in the audio CD album, Knowing God Through the Word, is also available for a donation. We encourage everyone to send a gift, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this fourth CD free of charge. Request teaching number TK144 when you write or call and we'll be pleased to send it to you. Today, Andrew mentioned the Gospels edition of our Life for Today's Study Bible and Commentary. 
Ask for book number T302 when you contact the ministry. Let me remind you once again that today is our last day to make this fourth teaching in our five-part set available as a free gift. We ask for a donation of any amount for our DVD, for our CD, the entire album. But there's some people that wouldn't even give or could not give in that situation. And so because of that, we make each individual teaching in this set available free of charge one at a time. Today's the last day we'll offer the fourth teaching out of five on this. And it's the one that covers what I was talking about today, knowing God through the Word. My partners have enabled me to make these teachings available, and so we want you to have it. Please call or write the number that you see on your screen and request this teaching today. Our web address is awme.net. You can order ministry materials online 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or you can use your credit card to order by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. Again, that's 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours extend from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. If you prefer to write us, our address is AWME. That's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. We hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He will be in Colorado Springs, Colorado for the 25th Annual U.S. Ministers Conference, September 29th through October 3rd. He'll also be in Gosforth, Newcastle-upon-Tyne in the U.K. on October 18th through the 19th and in Buxton, England for the Annual AWME Ministers Conference, October 20th through the 22nd. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. I'd like to encourage you to go to our website and check out the Andrew Womack Living Commentary. You know, this is a Bible program where you actually get three different versions of the Bible, about four different commentaries, mine being one of them. And I have comments on about 15,000 verses in the Bible. And it's really, really good. I mean, God has used these comments to bless me. I, I think it's a tremendous thing. And the reason we call it a living commentary is because it's an ongoing process. I'm still writing anywhere from 100 to 200 to sometimes 500 verses per month, and you get updates on a monthly basis. So you can check out a sample of this on our website. The address is right there. So please uh, check this out today. Be sure to tune in for more Gospel Truth on Monday.